Hi everyone, Drew Prody here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. In today's episode, we have microbiologist Kieran Krishnan on the episode to talk to us about our pets and their gut microbiome and how to keep our pets healthy and why coconut oil may not be as healthy as we think it is. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, biohacking, mindfulness, and functional medicine with the goal of helping you understand how your brain is not broken. I'm your host, Drew Perot, and each week, my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guest is research microbiologist Kieran Krishnan. Kieran comes from university research background and spent several years with hands-on R&D in the fields of molecular medicine and microbiology at the University of Iowa. Kieran established a clinical research organization where he designed and conducted dozens of human clinical trials in human nutrition. Kieran is a co-founder and partner at New Science Trading, a nutritional technology development and research company, and he's the co-founder and chief science officer at Microbiome Labs. He's been a guest expert on national and satellite radio, and he's appeared in several international documentaries and has been a guest speaker in many online health summits as a microbiome expert. He's currently involved in over 16 human clinical trials on probiotics and the human microbiome. Kieran, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. We've done so many episodes on the gut microbiome, but it's really a pleasure to have somebody who's firsthand involved in the research aspect of it. Yes, I'm deep down in the poop, <laughs> <laughs> working with the microbiome. So it's, it's super exciting to be here. Thank you for having me. Where did this passion for the microbiome and this obsession with poop yeah. <laughs> you know, and bacteria come from? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I was actually just talking about that uh, at, a, at a meeting yesterday when we were working with a bunch of graduate students who are in microbiology right now. And we're trying to figure out how everyone got into this space, right? And part of that is we're trying to figure out how do we attract more people into this world because microbiome research is going to be the biggest thing in science for the next couple of decades. For me, it was as simple as a movie. So I was a freshman year in college. I knew like any good Indian, I was pre-med, right? So I knew I was going to do science of some sort. Uh, and I always had a passion and curiosity for science to begin with, but I didn't know what area of study I wanted to do. And I was watching uh, a movie, I think it was a second day in the dorms at the University of Iowa, and they were playing that movie Outbreak. Uh, with Morgan Freeman and Dustin Hoffman, and there was these viruses, you know, killing people. And then these people with the CDC were chasing down viruses and trying to figure out cures for them. And I was like, that's what I want to do. You know, <laughs> I want to be in the in the belly of the beast when it comes to like infectious disease and so on. And so the very next day I went and I inquired um, in the uh, sciences and figured out, oh, that's microbiology. You know, that's those are the people that study viruses and bacteria and pathogenic organisms. So that's when I got into microbiology and it became uh, an absolute passion of mine. I'm uh, also secretly obsessed with astronomy and, and the large scale things in the, out, in the universe, uh, as, as mind boggling as those topics can be. I, I find that the microbial world is even more fascinating because it's here, it's present, it's controlling virtually everything we do, and we know so little about it. Right. So all that kind of concept fascinated me from day one. But the interesting thing when we were chit chatting earlier is you were saying that after your education, you knew that you wanted to go into the practical application of it and not just go into the just the research side. Nothing wrong yeah. with it. But for you, your DNA was more built or your microbiome was more <laughs> <Exactly>. built <laughs> to want to explore the aspects around how can people actually use this information? Yeah. Where, where did that inspiration come from? Uh, you for know, nutrition and like the practical aspects of understanding the microbiome. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of it is actually inspired by my mom and seeing uh, like she's a medical doctor. And when I grew up and I grew up part in Malaysia and in India. And in fact, I was so interested in everything that she did um, that she named one of her clinics after me, Clinic Kiran in Malaysia. That was her main clinic. I used to actually go in and watch her do procedures on people, suturing people and things like that. Um, so I would see her doing these applications that didn't make sense to me at the time, but it would cause a lot of alleviation of pain and suffering for people. You know, So that direct impact that you have on an individual was very powerful to me and big part of the driver of why I wanted to get into science in the first place. So what I understood even at that time about her is she had 
a certain amount of inherent and learned knowledge on how the body works and the functionality of the tools that she had available to her and how she could use that to actually impact the lives of people. And I'm a bit of a megalomaniac, you know. I if I'm the way I think is if I can help one person, maybe I can help a million people, right? So my whole inclination was I could sit in a lab and do research and maybe come up with some cool stuff. But if I got myself into the business side of all of this and worked with the awesome researchers who are doing the, the, the great work, maybe my role can be pulling that work out of the lab and making it applicable to millions of people. So how much of your mom's influence, if I could skip yeah. back to your mom, how much of your mom's influence, even though she was a medical doctor, kind of came from like the Indian slash like old remedies, you know, sort of this yeah. like ancient medicine, whether it's Ayurveda mm -hmm. or, or other practices from India, did any of that seep into uh, her practice at all? You know, she, she never studied Ayurveda, but she always understood the, um, what we would call kind of the, the ancient practices of certain foods. Right, so like she- the healing power of foods, exactly. home remedies. Home remedies. Um, she was always open to that. And when I started getting into supplements and nutritional therapies, in fact, the clinical research organization I started, she was my first medical director. And she would run the clinical trials on her patients using simple vitamins like vitamin D. We would do, we did three or four vitamin D studies for another company. We did some vitamin K studies and she would see these amazing effects in her patients. And, and it would kind of connect back to the simplicity of, you know, uh, the Ayurvedic approach or the traditional Chinese medicine approach and so on. So she became really interested in that world itself. So she's trained as an allopath, very, you know, pharmaceuticals, procedures, surgery, but um, she has always had this ingrained uh, openness to Ayurveda and other natural remedies just because of where we come from. I always tell people like my first experience with integrative medicine was just growing up and having my whole family again, Indian, so many are doctors or in the healthcare mm -hmm. world and uh, family members, medical doctors saying like, oh no, let's not give him antibiotics first. Let's give him like turmeric mixed with honey and like have him drink this and do salt water gurgles. Absolutely. Gurgles. And my, and my grandma did a lot of that stuff, you know? So when I, I, when I grew up in India, we would do all that, like, you know, simple things like lime and water, um, you know, she would make certain teas, certain tinctures of things. Uh, we would use turmeric a lot, but we'd also um, use other herbs. And these are all home remedies that they've right. that they've perfected for thousands of years. You know, and that I think inevitably sleep seeps into every Indian doctor's mindset somewhere in the back. You know, no matter how hardcore allopathic they are. And then if you can kind of crack open the door a little bit for them uh, and show them some science behind it as well, then it really opens up a world of integrative uh, thinking. You know, so, so my mom had that uh, mindset and that became a big driver for me because to me, it almost became a point where I want to prove to her that this integrative nutritional side of the world is going to be as powerful as everything she knows about in the pharmaceutical side of the world. You know, so there's, there's a lot of that as well. And I spend a lot of time now, every time we publish a study, every time we do a new trial, we show efficacy, I make it a point we have, I, my mom and I have lunch and mm -hmm. I give her the information, you know, and she's love, she loves receiving it. I got a few uh, Indian uncles and aunts that I need to send over to those lunches. <laughs> Absolutely. Lunch yes. Yes. No, what's really great about, uh, as you mentioned, and you are one of those individuals that's doing the science. Yeah. Uh, people say sometimes, well, my, in my tradition, in, uh, you know, in my uh, Chinese medicine tradition or in my Korean medicine or in South America, we used to do this, but you know, the world also did need that science to validate it so that we could start bringing it into um, practice and show people what the possibilities are. So speaking of the science, cause I want to jump around a little bit and we'll come back to yeah. your uh, story. Um, you, we're going to talk about some of the, the, what I really liked is that when my team and you were putting together the topics for this podcast, you had so many unique topics that we just have never covered before when it came to the microbiome where we never went as in depth with. So I want to take a little bit of a pause on your story. And I want to start off in this topic that you've talked about before, which we've never shared, which is the microbiome of pets. Yes. And you've talked about how dogs in specifically can have a leaky, leaky gut in the same way that human beings can have leaky gut. And it's one of the major drivers of chronic illness. I know there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast that are pet fans. Yeah. 
So let's start off with what dog lovers can understand and what they need to learn about when it comes to their pet's microbiome and leaky gut. So that's a really important topic. Um, you know, we have, I think it's 68% of American households have pets. Um, 85 million families in the U.S. have pets, dogs and cats, right? So they are an integral part of our society, of the web of our society, of our family structures. I know before I had kids, our dogs were our fur babies and they were equally important to us as our kids would be. Um, and we are making them sick, right? We have created diseases in dogs that would not exist in their canine cousins in wolves and you know the the wild versions of dogs they have We've, the same disease that we have they have the same they have diabetes they have various cancers they have heart disease depression right? i saw depression, an ad for yes. you know does your do is your dog depressed <laughs> right absolutely severe anxiety you know our dogs are suffering the most common one is atopic dermatitis which is a form of an allergy right and we know that asthma and allergies are pandemic among our own kids and ourselves so we've created the same thing in our dogs uh, and the big driver of that is dysbiosis, is this word that people use to describe a dysfunction in the, in the population of your bacteria. It's dysbiosis within the dog's microbiome and also on the skin and within the gut microbiome specifically. In part, a lot of that is driven by the fact that these are canines and we're feeding them grain-based foods all the time, totally. right? And it's grain-based dried extruded foods that don't really have any of the nutritional comp components that they would typically eat. Um, they also have a very different microbiome than we do. The d different types of microbes, less diversity, higher amounts of clostridia, for example, than we would have, uh, which would, would essentially make us sick, um, but, but it's really important to maintain the dog's health. So it was our hypothesis that we know that this leaky gut in humans is a major driver of what we call low-grade chronic inflammation, right? And low-grade chronic inflammation is a soup in which the vast majority of our chronic illnesses breed. And we hypothesize since the dogs suffer from many of the same types of problems that we do, we're likely causing low-grade chronic inflammation in the dogs. And the biggest source of this low-grade chronic inflammation comes from in the gut itself. So leaking in of toxins from bacteria that reside in your gut into your circulatory system. Because their tight junctions, just like ours, are developing little holes yep. inside of them. So things that are supposed to stay on the outside are now making their way on the inside. Making their way on the inside, yeah. And, and it's called, the fancy term for that is metabolic endotoxemia. The word endotoxemia means endo, meaning inside, and toxemia is uh, toxins in the blood. And the endo part of it is toxins that are generated within the system itself. So we can't get away from them, right? These are microbes that live naturally in the gut that produce a toxin called LPS. This lipopolysaccharide toxin is produced and released all the time in the digestive tract, but it's supposed to stay in the digestive tract and you're supposed to poop it out, you know, eight to 10 hours later. But if your intestinal lining is leaky, it will leak through and end up in your bloodstream. A version of now, almost poisoning yourself. Absolutely, Because yeah. the barriers the barriers are, aren't functioning. Aren't functioning. It's yeah. so similar to like, you know, you have a castle, it's being protected by a wall. Yeah. That wall now has holes in it and yep. invaders can get inside. Absolutely. And here's the beauty of all of this system, right? So that really important barrier that functions a, in, in a form of protection for us. In fact, arguably the most important form of protection in our body, that, that really thin, uh, tenable barrier is controlled in large part by microbes in our body. Like we have little that we can do to form that barrier, repair the barrier, strengthen the barrier ourselves. We don't necessarily have genes in our system that we can turn on to repair a damaged part of the barrier. We count on certain microbes in our microbiome to turn on those signals for us. So without the appropriate microbes there, the barrier becomes more and more weak over time and you could have a component of it that's dysfunctional in six inches of your intestine, but you've got 28 feet or so of intestine. So over time, the leakiness can spread throughout the, the, the entire structure of the intestinal lining. That's the same thing that's occurring in dogs. Now, nobody has done a leaky gut study in dogs. And so we had to prove that this even existed. And so we worked with a, 
uh, a major veterinary university and uh, with a professor there who was really keen on studying this with us because we presented it at a, at a conference where she was there. Um, and we had to develop a model to study it with dogs. One of the ways that we, we can induce this type of endotoxemia in dogs if their barrier systems are dysfunctional is by feeding them uh, meals with high amounts of coconut oil in it. Mm. You know, so surprisingly, coconut oil is one of the biggest drivers of this kind of endotoxic response in the body. Yeah, even a lot to of humans. dogs accidentally eat coconut oil mm -hmm. and then have a severe reaction. Yeah, absolutely. It happened to my uh, my sister has dogs. Yeah, and there was at one point in time they were just feeding him, and I probably was feeding him something right. too. And he's a small dog, so they are less resilient with yeah. some of those foods, human foods. Was eating coconut oil and then started having uh, a little bit of blood in his uh, stool. Mm. They took him to the vet and the vet said, you cannot give him these fats. They're right. basically messing him up. So what, what exactly is going on when, and you also mentioned humans, which I'm very interested in. Yeah, so we should talk about the coconut oil and humans yes. aspect of it as well. Um, but what's going on in the dogs is that coconut oil has a lot of long chain fatty acids. These right. long chain fatty acids are strong antimicrobials. So they're killing bacteria in the gut as you're digesting it. When you kill these bacteria that contain this uh, LPS, this endotoxin, then you're releasing more endotoxin. So there's more of those toxins to actually get absorbed into the system. The other thing is coconut oil also induces the production of what we call lipid rafts. These are um, shilomicrons is a fancy word for it, but these are little carriers that go into the, past the gut lining and pick up dietary fats and bring it into the system. You know, that's your body's respond to, oh, fat's coming in the diet, I gotta bring some fat into the system and use it as a nutrient. So the lipid, uh, sorry, the toxin that is being released by these bacteria are actually fatty acids. So they get inevitably brought in by these lipid rafts itself. So there's two parts to it. That's a higher amount of, of LPS being released and then more of it inadvertently being transported into the system as well by our own fatty acid carrier system. So we are increasing the amount of endotoxins that are appearing in the circulatory system after a meal that has a, a fat like a coconut oil, you know, and, and it's the same thing in dogs. So let's, let's look at that for, let's jump to humans for a second before we yeah. come back to dogs. So is coconut oil bad for us? Yeah, and that's a really important question because it's a darling of the health food industry, right? It's in everything. Um, we've now finally come away from this idea that fats are bad, which is a good idea, right? We've demonized fats for a very long period of time, but it also doesn't mean that we necessarily need to go to high, high amounts of fat either. And especially coconut oils with European cultures. Um, and it's important to note that your microbiome is, it, the form and function is dependent on your, your lineage, right? Where you come from. And so a lot of the people that are European, of European descent, their ancestors never saw coconut. And so their body doesn't necessarily know how to deal with the types of complex fats that are in coconut, uh, coconut oil. And so I would say in significant moderation, because there's some really good published studies that show that of all the oils they tested, even vegetable oils, a lot of the times which can be rancid and have a lot of peroxides or, or bad lipids in it, um, the coconut oil was the most toxigenic. It increased this endotoxemia leaky gut far more than any of the other oils tested. Now, interestingly, omega-6 oils and omega-3 oils reduced endotoxemia. So like omega-3 oils and, you know, like a fish oil mm -hmm. that people might have, or let's say like an olive oil, Yes, that would be a little bit better for the mi gut microbiome. Absolutely, yeah. So when you're thinking about things from the microbiome perspective and how we can improve that barrier function and reduce that chronic endotoxemia and that chronic low-grade inflammation, which is really at the root cause of most illnesses, we have to look at omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids as our primary source of, of good, healthy oils. Now, if your microbiome is really healthy, you can handle more of the coconut type oil or the saturated fats and so on. Um, so a lot of that is based on just how healthy and dysfunctional your microbiome is. What about everybody who's putting MCT oil in their coffee? <laughs> yeah, so that's an interesting thing. And I, 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 I am very curious to do a study on that. Right. You know, but, but of all of the components within coconut oil, the least toxigenic is the MCT component. Got it. The medium chain triglycerides. So in coconut itself, in the raw coconut oil, you've got the long chain triglycerides which are problematic. Yeah. Uh, the medium chain, I would say, is, um, is better than the long chain triglycerides.
Wow. So going back to pets. Yes. So yeah. you're, you're blowing our mind over here. Everybody's got to put down their coconut oil. <laughs> Stop with the oil pulling. Just take it easy on take it. it easy. You know, take it easy on it's it. It's funny. There's this Instagram meme that I saw floating around. It was like, coconut oil is great. It's good for healthy skin. You know, you could put on your skin. You could do oil pulling with it. Also, like, you know, if you're tired, rub it in your eyes. Like it was a joke, right? <laughs> right. They're like joking around. Like we overuse it a little bit. Yes. Yeah. You know? Slap it on your dog. Don't slap it on your dog. <laughs> so going back to pets, yep. we know now that there's, so so the study that you did, were you able to prove that there is leaky gut that's happening in pets? Yes. So uh, and here's, here's some interesting nuances between pets and humans. Uh, we can, if, if a human has severe leaky gut, we can give them what we call a challenge meal. That's typically a high fat, high caloric meal. That will induce more leakiness in the gut if their gut is dysfunctional and if their berry is dysfunctional. We typically see uh, the peak levels of toxins in the blood at five hours after the meal. So five hours postprandial. In pets, it takes up to 12 hours to increase the toxicity level. So there's a difference in mechanism of how the leakiness occurs in the pet. But one thing that is that is absolutely clear is that they do have the same leakiness. It takes longer for it to occur. And when it, when it does occur, it seems to hang around a little bit longer than in humans as well. So they are experiencing this. This is a big driver of chronic inflammation in our pets and likely uh, at the root cause of the inflammatory and other conditions that we've essentially created in these animals. So based on the learnings and just what you've read overall, when people are thinking about how to care for their pets, mm -hmm. what's important to know when it comes to designing what the right food is for them? And are there any brands or services that you think are a good fit or should we start feeding our pets probiotics or their <laughs> probiotics that are made for them so what are the recommendations based on what you guys have looked at yeah so we you know first we wanted to identify whether leaky gut existed in pets which we which we saw it absolutely does and it absolutely increases inflammatory markers in a very significant way in pets so it is a, a component of disease in pets then there's no point looking at that unless you have a potential solution for it also, uh, which we looked at certain types of probiotics and to see if that can actually alleviate the leakiness in the, in the pet. And sure enough, we found that in as little as two weeks of applying a spore-based probiotic, so we work a lot with these bacillus endospores, um, applying those spore-based probiotics into the pet's diet, we were completely alleviating the leakiness in the gut. And on average, it was reducing it by about 75%. Um, in just a two-week period, and as, is that in addition to removing the fats that are no, causing we, this? No, we we kept we kept that in. Got we it. kept the stressor in. We kept the inducer in, <clears throat> and um, we wanted to see if we can actually make a significant change despite the the negative impact in there. Because the idea is that you know people may not perfect what they're feeding their dog. People may not put their dog in the absolute best environment. They may not um, have the best diet. And despite that, can we still improve the outcome of the dog? Um, and so so sure enough, we were able to. Uh, but that being said, dogs really should be eating meat. You know, they are canines. Um, and it should be pretty healthy meat. It should be grass fed. It should be, if they're eating chicken, it should be free range. All of the antibiotics that are found in the, these um, processed meats in the factory farms, all of the um, Roundup and glyphosate that you end up that ends up in these because uh, they're eating products. corn and they're eating exactly Skittles, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. There's that story from the totally. Washington Post about how a truck that had a bunch of candy in it spilled over on the highway. The police came and they said, where are you going with all this candy? And they said, right. we're actually going to the feedlot. We're going to go feed this to cows because this is a, just a cheap source of carbohydrates that we can add into the corn. Yep, absolutely. And in fact, cows are being fed other dead cows. That's where the whole um, encephalitis issue, you know, the mad cow disease came from. Right. Right. They're, they're being fed sick and dying cows that, that aren't going to make it to their growth weight. And instead, they're being mushed up and fed to the uh, to the health quote unquote healthy cows. Um, so there, there's a lot of practices that that really adulterate meat in a, in a significant way. And even a lot of the pet foods right now that that gear themselves towards more meat and no and grain free, they're still using that kind of low quality meat, you know. And it's right. a lot of chicken meal you'll see in there, uh, pig meal. The meal is like the the 
ash, the throwaway stuff that occurs from the food processing side of it. So there are some companies, and I can't think of the brands off the top of my head, but uh, there's like a boutique pet food store by my house where you can go and you can actually get frozen chunks of grass-fed high-end meat. Um, and that's what we should be feeding our pets. You know, yeah. That's what their guts are designed around. And I, yeah, I know there's some online companies. We'll do a little research and link it up in the yeah. show notes. I know my uh, sister uses a few for her dogs. Um, it's super fascinating because you know you see dogs with arthritis these days. If you see dogs with all these other diseases, as we mentioned, and really, if you care about your pet, and you know, dogs in the wild, as you mentioned, don't get these things. Often, it's sort of like zoo animals if they're not being fed their original diet dogs yep. and then humans that all kind of end up with the same diseases. What about cats? Anything that you want to mention about cats? <laughs> cats are weird. You know, they're the, the, the keepers of the underworld. We haven't messed with them yet. <laughs> but no, you know, we, we haven't done work on cats yet, but we suspect um, talking to the veterinary researchers that we were working with that the, the functionality will be the same in cats, but we're going to look at that. We actually did some studies on chickens and we are actually doing studies on pigs as well, because part of our thinking is that, you know, if, if we want to have the biggest impact as a company, as an individual myself, uh, on human health and what's happening in society, we can create products like probiotics and prebiotics and, educate people on lifestyle and all that as much as we can do, which will improve them, but ultimately what they eat is gonna have the biggest impact on their lives, right? And and if we can then go further and improve the health of what they're going to eat, uh, then we can have a really tangible impact on on society in general. So we're doing a lot of studies right now on, on uh, farmed animals, on pigs and chickens and cows, seeing if we can improve the health of those animals without using things like vaccinations, without using things like antibiotics and hormones and reducing the prevalence of pathogens in these animals. Because of course, chicken is a big source of salmonella and campylobacter. Um, cows are a big source of E. coli that infect you know, hundreds of thousands of people every year. So we're, we're working on the agricultural side as well to see if we can improve the health of those animals at a low cost to make it feasible, tangible for that industry so that the vast majority of people that eat off of factory farms can actually eat slightly better, healthier food. And until then, of course, you know, there's a lot that's there, but we need a little less meat than we think. Totally. Yeah. And the meat that you do have stay away from factory farms, but yep. both for you and also your pet, if you care about your pet. Absolutely. And you know, uh, if we're thinking about our diet from a microbiome perspective, right, and that that's a really important way to think about what we eat is what do our bugs in our gut, the good stuff that should be prevalent, that should be f helping us and, and keeping us functional, what do they like? They like plant-based foods. You know, that's the biggest component of macronutrients that our gut microbes like. They love plant-based foods, even polyphenols, so we can't be afraid of fruits, you know, and colored fruits and vegetables, um, starchy foods, you know, uh, certain types of grains are okay, beta-glucans and things like that, you know, uh, complex barleys, all of these things feed different beneficial microbes in the gut. And the biggest thing on diet and the microbiome is diversity. Right? The more diverse our diet is, the more diverse our microbiome is. And if you look at all of the microbiome research out there, the one uh, prevailing th truth among all of them is that the high diversity in your gut microbiome is equivalent to health and longevity and resilience against disease. And the biggest driver of diversity within the microbiome is diversity in your diet. You know, so. And initially that microbiome comes from our mother. Yep. Right? The vaginal Absolutely. microbiome. There's a new study and a project you're undertaking, which is focused on exactly that, the vaginal microbiome. Can you talk about that? Yeah. And, you know, the way I have this mantle of we have to save the vaginas, right? And as it turns out, the vaginal microbiome dictates a lot about the woman's health uh, to begin with, which is obviously paramount, but then also about fertility and the ability to reproduce and then how healthy the child is when the child comes out. And, and when you look at it, the, the vaginal microbiome is a very tenuous ecology. It's, it has low diversity. There are basically four predominant lactobacilli that should make up 80% of the population. And they tend to be very sensitive to environmental changes, to antibiotic use, and so on, or anything that's actually entering that environment. So the, the thing that we looked at is lubricants. 
personal lubricants, right? And also the lubricants that are being used at OBGYN offices, because women are always going for exams and so on, and they use a, a, a pile of lubricant to go in there and examine and take specimens and so on. Um, our estimation and just looking at how lubricants are made, whether it's the personal lubricants or the stuff that's in the doctor's office, is that those are likely destroying the vaginal microbiome. Because mm. the microbes in there uh, do not like a lot of the components that are in the lubricant, right? And so that was our hypothesis. Now we were trying to find for the longest time a research group that actually was specialized in the vaginal microbiome because you need to find a group that has the cultures of the vaginal microbiome, way of studying those particular bacteria and so on. Initially, we found a group in South Africa and it became too hard to communicate with them with the time changes and all that. But then as it turns out, right in our backyard at University of Maryland is probably the preeminent researcher in the vaginal microbiome. And they have really awesome samples and all of this stuff that they've perfected with the vaginal microbiome. So they're doing a study right now uh, where they're looking at uh, women that are having intravaginal ultrasounds. And those are the ultrasounds where they actually go up in the, in the vaginal canal, and then, of course they use a lubricant on top of it. And what's scary about that is as we hypothesize, a single exposure to the lubricant that's used in that intravaginal ultrasound is dam significantly damaging to a large percentage of women that undergo the treatment. In some cases, the vaginal microbiome never recovers. Right? From a single- From a single exposure. Single exposure, yeah. which is crazy because, you know, Women are often at the OBGYN, they can go once a year yeah. for different items. And then when you're pregnant and other aspects of it, so yeah. that has a severe impact. Severe impact. And on the other side of it, because we know that microbiome is so sensitive, what are the implications? Can it lead more to increased yeast infections and other components? What are the implications of it? So that's exactly it. So you've got chronic yeast infections, you've got chronic UTIs, you've got chronic uh, bacterial vaginosis, which is a massive issue right now. And and the problem with the chronic bacterial vaginosis is one of the treatments for it is antibiotics, oral antibiotics. So you go in with a dysfunctional vaginal microbiome, which causes all of these irritative symptoms, and then the doctor will have to give you an antibiotic for it typically. That antibiotic is then gonna really harm your gut microbiome, which then puts you in this downward spiral of having all kinds of other issues, you know, um, that, that are related to a dysfunctional gut microbiome. Now, the other thing that's also scary is the vaginal microbiome dictates in large part the health of the women's ovaries, hormone production within the ovaries, and then also fertility. You know, we've got a strange epidemic of infertility happening within our modern society, right? And if that ever becomes compromised, then that's really the, the biggest impact on us as a species. Uh, obviously, at this point, we have populated the world very well, and we probably don't need to worry that much about re uh, continuing to populate the world because that uh, that uh, you know amount of number of people are just increasing exponentially all the time. But in the modern society, fertility is becoming a significant issue. Um, Whether that's then, a combination of like also families and couples waiting later to have babies, yeah, right. To also we you know diet and these other aspects that functional medicine doctors look at insulin, you know, metabolic syndrome. But on top of that, there's this new stressor, which you're talking about now, yep. which is the stress that we're putting on the vaginal microbiome. Absolutely, and, and that has a huge quality of life impact for women in our society. You know, when, when they're suffering from chronic bacterial vaginosis or UTIs or yeast infections, that's a, that's a major stressor. And of course, like we talked about, it can have hormonal impact and all that on the rest of the system. Treatments for those things like antibiotics can then have um, unintended consequences uh, with digestive issues, immune issues, and so on. Um, and, and all of it is happening at the doctor's office, you know, which is the scary part of it, right? So every woman basically from the age of 17 onwards is going in for regular examinations. And they're getting exposed to these lubricants that are going to create significant dysfunction in that really important biome. And then as you mentioned, when we first started this part of the conversation is ultimately then they are transferring that biome to the child. And what they're transferring is a dysfunctional biome that has long-term lifelong consequences for the child. Could be less diverse, yeah. could be less abundant in the strains that we need, yeah. or it could have development of other bacteria that we don't need yeah that's there so on a practical level for all the women and their husbands or partners 
or family members that care about them. Yeah. What, what can be done? Like for somebody who's listening to this today and is like, shoot, like I have an examination coming up. Yeah. You know, personal lubricants that are used in intimacy, uh, solo intimacy or with a partner, you know, well, this comes back to it, but a lot of people can use coconut oil. Yes. Right? Yes. Which I, which, which I, is, which may, how which do you I feel about that? Not a good idea. Not a no, good idea. Yeah. It's an antibiotic. It's an antimicrobial. Okay. So now no, no coconut, oil. No coconut oil. oil. I would go with extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin better. olive oil. Yeah. So if you're making love tonight yeah. and you're using your lubricant, Get to switch, olive oil. S- switch to olive oil. Yeah. Organic extra virgin olive oil. Organic extra. Yeah. That's going to be oil. much better. Now we are working on a lubricant. We've kind of had to reinvent the wheel on how you, how you create a lubricant uh, device because right. you know all of the things that go into making a um, a liquid more of a gel and making it slick and so on like the uh, emulsifiers and all that all those things are damaging to the vaginal microbiome mm-hmm. so we actually completely reinvented the wheel on how we create a lubricant and we also wanted the lubricant to change the chemistry in the vaginal canal something called the redox potential of the vaginal canal so it favors the growth of the beneficial bacteria so we didn't put any probiotics in there. We didn't put any prebiotics in there. We actually put nutrients that changed the the chemical metabolism of of the lubricant itself, um, which will then increase the growth of the beneficial bacteria. You know, so the lubricant not only is not going to harm, but it's actually going to be a conduit for improving the growth of the good bacteria. That's incredible. That's how. And but in the meantime, until that's out. Extra virgin olive oil is okay, going to be your best so choice. <laughs> it's probably difficult to go to your doctor and say, here's a bottle of olive oil. You know, some doctors exa- are, yeah, they're open to it. They're open to yeah, it. Yeah, I work with a lot of integrative OBGYNs who, who themselves actually have it in their practice, and they offer it as an option to, the, to, their, to their female patients. Um, but if you're going in and you go, you know, listen, I really don't want to be exposed to that. You need a lubricant for a simple exam or a pap smear try to use this and see if your doctor will do it. Any other you. options besides olive oil if people are like looking for something? Um, if they're looking at, at oils in particular or fats, you might even consider something like um, um, like a like a ghee would be would be Got okay, it. but I don't know if that's going to interfere with. But some no of the existing extracts. products are out there until no, you guys figure there it isn't, out. Isn't no, and that's we've checked all oh kinds of gosh. products. You know, in fact, the one of the great things in our initial conversation with the South African University is they had actually checked all of the stuff on the market and found that everything damages the vaginal microbiome. You know, I don't encourage lying, but sometimes to get something done. I might just tell somebody that like I have an allergy towards it. Right. You know, yeah, exactly. I, back in the day, because I've been eating mostly gluten free since the year 2000 yeah. when my health journey started because I had severe acne, which is one of the topics we're going to yeah. jump into next. Um, when I was at restaurants and I would say like, OK, like they didn't know what gluten free was right. 20 years ago. And I didn't even barely understand what gluten free was. Um, so I would just tell people, listen, you can't put it in because I have an allergy. Yeah. People get that. Yeah. Right. So I wonder either shop around for an OBGYN who's open-minded, yep. try to write them a letter in advance and fax them over. I realize that when you try to just really educate people and you tell them what you're you know, going through and why this is important, because I'm sure people are worried about liability and they're just not educated totally. about it. They're like, well, we have to use this medical grade thing. Mm-hmm. You can't just bring in this bottle of olive oil that's out there, but try your best. And if that doesn't work, maybe just lie and say you have an allergy to something totally, and these yeah. lubricants affect you and you have to use this instead. You know, and here's the thing with, with when this kind of brings up a bigger topic, right? Where um, we really have to advocate for ourselves, right? We, we put a lot of trust and, and count on our medical professionals, but the fact of the matter is they don't know everything, right? And they, they don't, they're not aware of a lot of the newest stuff that's right, coming They're doing out. their best. They're doing their best, But their right? education is often, if they're, let's say, between mid forties to, you know, mid fifties, which yep. is a big concentration of the uh, medical p- uh, pool, especially for doctors, their education is coming from back when they were in school. You know, yep. many people do not, they do their best and they're working so hard. You have family members that have doctors. So many of my family members are doctors. They're just unaware because that education is so old and they're not it on is. the latest science and research. Absolutely. And and they don't have time to keep up with the latest science and research, right? They're, they're literally spending 60 hours a week seeing patients. And so um, it becomes, it's incumbent upon us to actually help kind of promote some of that information to our own doctors. Um, but we have to advocate for ourselves. You know, that's that's the best absolute thing we can do. And, and that might be getting into some sort of an argument with your doctor, but that's fine, you know, because you're there advocating for your own health. So some of this research or the South African 
clinic is uh, any of it that you can provide that we can link up to? If it's is it out there? Is it published? Yeah. So actually, um, the work that's going on at University of Maryland will be will be coming out uh, probably sometime in the next five to six months. Uh, in fact, the researcher that we're working with there is at the the microbiome keynote show that we're putting on. Um, and he's actually going to be talking about this subject. So when when and a recording of his talk on the vaginal microbiome and all the things that are consequential around that, um, we'll have a recording of it, which we can be happy to make available to your audience. That'd be amazing. Uh, we'll put a link up there so people can go and watch it. And that conference you mentioned, by the time that people will listen to this, that conference will have passed. Yeah. And I know it's primarily for practitioners, but do you let lay lay people go? to the conference or is it only for practitioners? Yeah, it, at the physical conference itself, we make it for practitioners so we can keep a certain type of conversation right. within the com- within the conference itself, but then we make recordings of available all of the things available to everybody. And can you yeah. mention the name of that? So we, since we're talking about it, I would just love to give it a little plug if people want to check it out for next year. Yeah, if they if they go on to Microbiome Keynotes, um, and the idea behind that, the, the reason why we named it that way is, you know, we go to lots of conferences ourselves as a company. We go to about 160 conferences a year, and most conferences will have a main keynote talk, and that's kind of the, a, you know, the, the the biggest speaker there. We wanted to create a conference all of keynote speakers, so all of our speakers are keynote worthy people in their field. Um, so we have eight, I think, keynote talks uh, in a single day. And then the second day, we've got this mini mastermind session where it's like speed dating with the speakers. You know, we basically station them in particular areas and people rotate every 30 minutes between the stations where you have 30 minutes of just casual open conversation with the speakers to share as much as you want to share, ask questions that you want to ask, and then kind of stimulate just really good conversation. And um, and then if you're not able to attend, then if you go to Microbiome Keynotes, even for this year's event, you can actually get the recordings and the transcripts of the entire thing. Oh, so you can kind of be there virtually as well. You know, so that's our big kind of, we want to plant our flag in the ground and say, okay, we want to lead kind of the revolution and education on the whole microbiome world and bridge the gap between the academic research area and the clinical side of microbiome world and, and be that company kind of, uh, manages that 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 massive gap that exists. Fantastic! And for if you're looking for the conference, just look at the show notes. We'll have a, a link to it um, over there. So that's really exciting. And they can look into. Uh, do you know the speaker's name offhand? Yeah, his that, name is Jacques Ravel. Jacques Ravel. You yeah. can look up them if you want to look up more of the research that's related to this vaginal microbiome. So another study. Switching topics. Yeah. Uh, this is all super fascinating, by the way. I, you know, we've done so many interviews on the gut microbiome. I was uh, a co-author uh, of one of the first bestsellers in microbiome, like about the gut, about the gut. It was uh, called "Clean Gut" by Dr. Alejandro Younger. Yes, and yeah. I've been involved in this, you know, yeah. space for a while. Not from a research standpoint, but more just interviewing great researchers like yourself and practitioners. And uh, these are topics that, you know, I've never got a chance to get into. So thank you for educating our audience. Of course, my pleasure. So we talked about acne. So another study you just completed on was on acne and the gut access, the gut skin access. So tell us a little bit about that and what you saw when, what you saw in the results in the study that led to people having healthier skin in 30 days. Yeah. So that was really exciting. Uh, we've we've always heard about this gut skin axis that somehow the skin is affected by the gut. It's not exactly clear what all the mechanisms are that are involved in the gut modulating response on the skin. And and for a lot of people, including a lot of dermatologists, that's a very esoteric concept that you know when, somehow. When I had severe acne, my dermatologist said, "What you're eating has nothing to do, right, which is or what you or right? like the rest of your body has nothing to do with it. You're just." Going through this issue, yeah, exactly. They they think it's it's hormones, or you just have oh, or actually, what what's really interesting is they've always blamed a particular type of bacteria called P. acnesis. P. acne, yeah. yeah. Or now uh, cutie bacterium is how they change the name, so it's C. acnesis. Um, but and not that it couldn't be, not that hormones couldn't play a role, but they would just only blame it on that. Right, they would only blame it on that. And they would only blame on the existence of this one bacteria, right. which actually now is coming to, there's more studies coming out that shows that that bacteria may actually be beneficial to preventing acne rather than uh, causing acne. So there's there's a lot more that needs to be learned in that area. But our world is that, can we modulate the gut and change the skin from modulating the gut? Because one thing is really clear is that any dysfunction in the skin, whether it's acne or psoriasis or eczema, 
all comes from the inside out, right? Skin, what we see on the outside uh, appearance, grew from the inside. You know, skin doesn't become dysfunctional from the dermal, the uh, epidermal layer on the outside. It's not like an acne grows on the very outside. It grows from inside the body out. And same with rosacea and you know psoriasis and any of these conditions. So understanding that, all of the things that are feeding this dysfunction, feeding the growth of the acne lesion, or feeding the psoriatic lesions, are all coming from the inside of the body. And the biggest source of inflammation and or positive nutrients within the body is the gut. So it, it stands to reason that the gut has a significant impact on the skin. So that was the premise that we were working on. Now, what we wanted to do is also figure out what in the gut seems to be impacting in particular with acne. And so what we found is that there's research that shows that there's a particular type of bacteria called Rumnococcus. Uh, and there are likely other microbes too, because it's almost never just one bacteria, but Rumnococcus tends to be really low in people that have acne. Rumnococcus does a really interesting thing, is it produces short chain fatty acids, like butyrate, propionate, and acetate, which I'm sure you've talked about many times on your show. Uh, but there's, a, there's an important nuance to it in this uh, ratio between two of those short chain fatty acids, acetate and butyrate. And rumnococcus seems to modulate that ratio. Now, when rumnococcus modulates that ratio in the gut, that is then absorbed into the circulatory system and makes its way to the skin and has an impact on the uh, sebaceous gland in the skin and the types of bacteria that are growing there and how much sebum is being produced. All of that translates to whether or not you have an acne lesion on your face or you don't. And so what we wanted to see is with the spore-based probiotics that we work with, this is a five spore formula. We've published other studies showing that these spores can dramatically change the landscape of the microbial ecology in the gut. We wanted to see is can we impact rumnococcus? Can we increase it in patients that, uh, that, that are suffering from acne? And can that increase change chemistry in their blood? And ultimately, does that lead to reduction in acne lesions? And we saw all of those changes in a 30-day period. We saw people with acne with low rumnococcus, rumnococcus levels went up as we had hypothesized. With rumnococcus levels increasing, we saw that shift in the short chain fatty acid, both in the blood and in the gut. And then with that shift, we saw a significant reduction in the presence of these acne blemishes, lesions. 45% reduction in which a 30 day period. Which is incredible. And I know that for, for me, I mentioned earlier that, and I've talked about it on the mm -hmm. podcast before, that it was kind of acne that got me started into this journey. Yeah, yeah. And then one day I was at a conference here in Los Angeles, uh, just right as I uh, graduated from high school. And, um, and I heard a research, uh, not a researcher. I had a woman who was talking about it more from a vegan perspective. She was like, dairy is very problematic and it can cause a lot of challenges for people. And by the way, if you're suffering from acne and my ears like perked up, mm. you know, try maybe going off of dairy for a little while because it could be inflammatory. And that led to this whole thing of like, oh, wow, what foods am I eating that are causing me specifically issues, especially because I had been on a lot of antibiotics growing up. Yeah. Right. So today I don't have acne, but interestingly enough, certain foods that I have, I'll, I'll, ha I'll eat them. Like I had a little bit of butter the other day and I have a li little shiner, you know, uh, right yeah. on my, uh, and it will cause like a, cause like a, a, a breakout. Yeah. So these spore based probiotics, which you, your company is behind and that you guys uh, design, which we'll talk about more in detail. So what's actually the mechanism of, of, of like, of what are they doing to help actually that, that modulation process? Like what is the bacteria itself doing? You were talking about the levels going up and the levels going down, but what are the introduction of these spore based probiotics doing to help prevent that growth of acne? Yeah, so that's actually why we really became interested in these microbes. We were looking for microbes that could act as orchestrators of the rest of the microbiome, right? So our thinking is that you've got a hundred trillion bacteria in your gut, essentially. No matter what probiotic you take, even if it's a hundred billion or 200 billion cells in a probiotic product, if we're counting on the specific function of those bacteria, they're a literal drop in the ocean compared to the rest of the population. So they're not really gonna do a whole lot. So we were looking for microbes that actually had the ability to influence the rest of the population. And is this what you call key strains? That's what we call keystone strains. Yeah. Keystone strains. Keystone strains. Um, and, and changing things like the diversity in the microbiome, increasing the growth of these important keystone strains within the gut becomes a system, system uh, sy systemic 
um, becomes a systemic um, impact on your on your microbiome. So you're saying that there's basically these alpha leader m- m- bacteria. Exactly. Yeah. That you are introducing into the gut. Yeah. And they are sort of telling everybody else what to do and how to flow. Absolutely. You know, in fact, uh, Dr. Dr. Roizen, um, who works with Dr. Oz, I think, um, wrote an article on Who's it. Who's uh, Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic, yeah. yep. Uh, re- researcher, clinician, uh, prolific author. And he wrote a, a, a short article on these spores, and he called them the Chuck Norris of probiotics because they're such <laughs> badasses, right? They literally get in there and they kick butt. They do something really or interesting. Or the Beyonce. Yeah, well, the, oh, exactly. Or the Beyonce. Um, that's how. That's exciting for us to think about our Beyonce probiotics. Um, <laughs> that's real impactful, right? So they're the influencers of the microbial world. Wow. You know, and here's an interesting story of how some of them have actually been discovered. Um, and it all comes back to poop, right? So in World War II, when the German army was in North Africa in their campaign, most of the German soldiers were dying from dysentery rather than from the war itself. And what they realize is that locals, when they would get an upset stomach, when they would start getting diarrhea symptoms of it, they would actually seek out and find dried camel dung and consume it. And that was actually their natural remedy for treating gut infections. And so sure enough, they took back a bunch of dried camel dung to try to isolate what was in it that actually had these amazing antimicrobial effects and they found these bacillus endospores. That was the um, initiation and the launch of the first prescription probiotic into the market in 1952 using these same bacillus endospores. It was launched for treatment of gut infections and dysentery. As it turns out, these microbes do something called quorum sensing, which is a microbial's uh, a microbe's ability to read the microbial environment, right? So they get in there, these Beyonce's get in there, and they they scan the rest of the microbial environment, and they find microbes that shouldn't be there that are overgrown. They will sit next to them and produce up to 25 different antibiotics in that little environment to bring down the growth of those microbes. When they find microbes that are underrepresented that should be at higher levels, they will actually sit next to them and produce prebiotics and other compounds that actually help increase the growth of those particular microbes. So they do this amazing orchestration role in the microbiome, and we've outsourced all of that capability to them because we can't do that ourselves, right? If our gut is dysbiotic, we've got an overgrowth of Staphylococcus, an overgrowth of Klebsiella, or Pseudomonas, or whatever the dysbiotic bacteria are, and we have low levels of the really good bacteria like Acromantia and Fecalum bacteria, we don't have a mechanism that's that's endogenous to us to fix that, right? We have like outsourced our cells it. can't go in we there can't do and that. repair. Yeah. We rely on this symbiotic relationship yeah. with bacteria. Absolutely. We've relied on exposure to them for them to go in and clean up our, our household. Right, so we provide them a home. Uh, they live within us as normal commensal bacteria, but they come in, they read the environment, they figure out what's dysfunctional in the population, and then they fix it. And that's what really got us interested in these bugs because we know that there are lots and lots of chronic illnesses that are related to this dysfunction and imbalance in the microbiome. And if we have a tool that can fix that dysfunction, then we might have a powerful tool in fixing a lot of these conditions. So the interesting thing about these. Uh Keystone strains that I, that I'd love to know is that you were talking earlier about that we all have depending on the region that we grew up in the diet that our ancestors were eating even our great great grandparents were eating you know that sort of influences us so if you came from a region that didn't have as much coconut oil or if you came from a region that wasn't eating as much meat or if you came from a region that was eating more carbs like the Tarumara tribe in you know Mexico or mm-hmm. other individuals who have 80% of their diet is like corn, you know, yep. purple corn and things like that. So everybody's microbiome is different depending on the region. So are these keystone strains different depending on the region that you came from? They are to, to a large part. Now, the spores are universal colonizers. That's what's really interesting about them is that you find them in the digestive system at relatively the same amount across the globe. And the reason for that is our main exposure to them is through the environment. Right, and it's not necessarily, it's not a bacteria that's passed on from mother to child like a lot of our other commensal bacteria. These are what we call postnatal commensal bacteria. Our exposure to them is supposed to come from the environment. And their 
relative distribution, whether you're in the Tibetan plateaus or in the South Pole or the North American plains is about the same in the environment. So all of our ancestors, no matter what region you're from, got a pretty equivalent exposure to these particular spores. Now- Through the air, through the, is that in the cow dung? Is it- Exactly, it's everywhere. It's in the soil, water, air. Like if you look at desert dust that blows up from the Sahara Desert and blows across all of the Middle East, Central Asia, and so on, that contains high levels of these spores. Wow. You know, and they found them, they've done glacial ice core studies uh, where they pull out cores from glacial ice that are two million, three million years old, and they find that these particular spores are very prevalent in the environment even at that time. Not only that, they actually, the, the spores that they isolate from the glacial ice, they can actually still plate them, they're still alive. Mm -hmm. So three million year old spores are still alive. In fact, the oldest spore was found not too far from here in a, in a cave in Southern California out of salt crystals. They were able to melt bacteria out of the salt crystals and plate them and they were still alive. They were 250 million years old. Wow. Still alive. That's crazy. Right? And these are same kind of spores that we have in our diet. So they've been here way before us, right? They've wrote, written the rules in how multicellular organisms communicate and they know better about what our population of bacteria should look like within our microbiome than we do. So you call them spores, but they are bacteria. They are bacteria. Right? So they're, that's an important distinction. I'm glad you mentioned that because people conflate the, the issue with spores and soil organisms and all that all the time. So there are certain classes of bacteria that can form an endospore. Um, the, our body is their natural environment. When they leave our body through defecation, which they do after about two or three weeks, they don't stay forever. Uh, but, and they leave the body because they use the environment as a vector to get from host to host. So when they leave our body, they're no longer in their ideal growing place and condition. And because of that, they cover themselves in this uh, armor-like coating. It's basically- it's a biofilm? It's actually a calci calcified protein coat. Um, so it's a, it's a hard shell coating. They are metabolically inactive, so they're not multiplying and doing all the things bacteria normally do. They are basically in a dormant, suspended state in the outside environment. Now, they can sit there in the outside en environment in that state indefinitely, right? The oldest one I mentioned is 250 million years old. They found ones that are 50 million years old in fossilized amber that they can still grow, that are still alive. Uh, in fact, if and if we ever want to get super nerdy, we can talk about the idea of panspermia, about where um, ingredients for cellular life came in uh, from on this earth, came from extraterrestrial uh, impact from meteorites and so on. They found that these spores can actually exist in outer space travel for seven years mm -hmm. in the vacuum and cold of outer space. So they are likely candidates for seeding the earth with nucleic acids and proteins and all that for starting cellular life. Um, you know, but but the idea here is that these these spores are sitting around waiting for us to consume them. And then when we consume them, they could have been sitting, you can go for a hike in the canyon. Right, and, and if you're smart and don't use hand sanitizers when you pick up your sandwich that you're gonna eat next, you would have picked up some spores from being out in the wilderness. And that spore could have been sitting in that soil for two million years in that dormant form. You eat that spore, it goes past your gastric system because it, and it'll survive stomach acid because of the spore form. When it gets to your small intestine, it'll become a live living probiotic cell within 20 minutes. Because it sheds that gut. calcium yeah, it sheds that, sheds that coating. We actually do a molecular handshake of sorts with these spores. Uh, they have these receptors that stick out of this armor-like coating to sense where they are. And we've got a receptor in our mucosal lining to welcome them into our gut. So they do this molecular handshake, the warmth and the pH of the gut, all of those factors make them go um, back home. So they break out of the shell and then they go into the gut, they start reading the environment and start kicking butt for us. That's incredible. Like, they do amazing things, right? Isn't that crazy? They do things that we do not understand how these things can be done. And these are just bacteria. They're so simple. Yeah, in fact, there's some ideas that are out there that people have talked about, which is who's in charge? Is it them right? or is it us? Yeah, right? and I call the human a holobiome. I, I always like to spread this term as much as I can. The definition of a holobiome is a super organism. Right, uh, and my analogy is that a human is actually a walking, talking rainforest. Right, we're actually made up of thousands of different microecologies, uh, from our head to our toe, all the way inside, and every aspect of our body has its own ecology, a microbial ecology. 
and, and communication between all of these ecologies is what drives human health and wellness. Dysbiosis or some sort of dysfunction in this ecology is what starts the process of disease. You know, we can do, we can, uh, we can basically relate virtually every chronic illness that we, that we deal with to some dysfunction in our microbial ecology. Mm. So when we talk about these soil-based probiotics, which, you know, that's really under like the Microbiome Labs, the, yeah. company, the company that you co-founded, yeah. and you're involved with a lot of different uh, companies out there. You know, what was the, like, take us back to like the start, yeah. right? On top of all the great education that you've provided us with, you know, how did you even come across these spores and learn about this enough to be excited about creating uh, a new solution for people that are out there? Um, yeah, take us, take us that uh, place. Yeah, so the, um, the origin story of this really comes from the research company that I had before Microbiome Labs. Um, I had a clinical research organization called Live Smart, and the idea was designing you know, affordable, smart clinical trials for nutritional companies. Most of the clinical trials out there are based on the pharmaceutical model. They're far too expensive for nutritional companies to run big trials with disease endpoints. So I, my whole idea was coming up with smarter ways to do clinical trials to prove functionality of nutritional products. So through that work, I, I actually got invited to a lot of companies as consultant as a consultant to help them with product development. And so one of the companies I started working with was, which was a large multinational company, and they wanted our group to look at developing the next generation of probiotics for them. This was about seven or eight years ago. And they were, they were seeing a lot of their competitors in the market going refrigerated, going 200 billion CFUs, going 19 cells, and you know all of these different parameters. And their question to us is, is that the direction we should be going in? Or is there something completely new and different within the probiotic space? So we took and on- what does the research show? Exactly, right? yeah, and then we took on the mantle of that and we said, okay, we'll, we'll go out there and figure this out for you. And we'll come back with a recommendation of what we think a really amazing next generation probiotic would be. It took us about two and a half years to do the work. And uh, my first part of it was, I wanted to find a probiotic that I knew would survive through the gastric system. Because as it turns out, the vast majority of probiotics on the marketplace will die going through the stomach. You know, and one of the first things we did is we tested the 40 top probiotics on the market for gastric survivability. And we saw everything was dying going through the stomach. We said, okay, if everything's dying, I know some of these things have an effect, then there's a whole other area of explanation of why some of the dead bacteria can have an effect in the gut, which we could talk about if, the, if we have time. But my focus was, are there microbes that are naturally designed to survive through this gauntlet of stomach acid, bile salts, pancreatic enzymes, all of these things that kill bacteria and are designed to kill bacteria, right? And if there is a microbe that can naturally survive through this gastric system, then it's likely designed by nature to be a probiotic because it's been given this special feature of surviving through bacteria gauntlet and getting to the site of action alive. So in our research work, we came into these bacillus endospores. Because of this armor-like coating, they can survive through. Then our next question is, okay, if they survive through, are they doing anything in the gut? And we found the preeminent spore researcher in the world, Dr. Simon Cutting, out of Royal Holloway London University. So we went and huddled with him and started working with him and said, okay, we need to know everything about your spores that you've been working with. And we started doing the research and compiling the data and doing some of our own studies. And we came back to that company and said, this is what we think is the next generation of probiotics. They survive through the gastric system. They seem to get into the site of action. They seem to modulate the rest of the microbiome. And here are all the studies we think you should be doing uh, once you launch a product with this. Now, to our, um, you know, to our benefit now, but at the time it seemed like a bummer, uh, the, that company got bought out by a larger company and they said, we're doing all this reshuffling. This is great information, thanks, but we're not gonna do anything with it. They didn't know right? what they were sitting on. They did not know at all what they were sitting on. And in fact, then at that point, we took this information to a, two or three other companies in our space and we, we sent it to their leadership group. They looked at it and they go, well, we don't really get it. We don't know what these spores are. It's four billion. Four billion is not enough. We our products are two hundred billion. You know we can't sell something with four. Like it just the concepts didn't make sense. So we said, okay, this is too compelling. We're going to have to put this in the market ourselves. Last thing we ever thought before that is we would ever have a product company out there, right? So 
we were compelled enough that this was gonna make a big impact on on society and human health that we decided to do microbiome labs and that's how that's how it came up. And and the product is called Mega Mega Spore Biotic. Mega Spore Biotic. Yeah. Is the flagship product. And I know that we use it at our clinic, at yeah. the Ultra Wellness Center and a lot of other functional practitioners. I can always tell what's a good probiotic or any other supplement that's out there because is is our functional doctors, our, our naturopathic doctors, our integrated doctors, even regular, you know, mainstream yeah. doctors, are they using it? Are they recommending it? That means they've done the, re they've looked into it. They know that the product has the right efficacy to work for the patients. They know how to vet it, right? And, and because of that, we actually made it initially available only through doctors and health practitioners. It was because We wanted to stand up there and, and talk about our research, talk about the, the paradigm shift in thinking about probiotics. And we knew that the health professional data, uh, cu customer base would be the people that would get it, right? It's a, that's a hard concept to talk to consumers directly about, certainly in a 30 second commercial or an ad of some sort. So we focus our efforts on the functional medicine um, and uh, the medical space. And that's that's where we end up going with all these conferences and so on. Um, but but since then, it's it's kind of bled out into the consumer world because consumers are so desperately seeking solutions out there. And we, a lot of our doctors, we've got now about 22,000 doctors that use the product on a regular basis. Um, a lot of them learned about it from their patients. Yeah, You know, their patients out there doing the diligent research to find the stuff that works that other people are talking about. And then the patients bring it to them and say, hey, I need you to carry this for me. You know, and so that's been a really um, awesome thing for us as well. Yeah, you know, being super real, there was, I think a couple times that that somebody that either was associated with your team or something else had reached out just to saying like, hey, listen, our founder talks on a lot of podcasts and other things like that. And I didn't even realize this. It went into like a, you know, another folder or something, but it was my sister, hmm. uh, even though I supervise the, the clinic and like my business partner is Dr. Mark Hyman. We have a lot of different things going on, including this uh, clinic called the Ultra Wellness Center in Massachusetts. And I'm not involved in any sort of patient care. I'm more just like big picture and yeah. supporting the work that they're doing. I didn't even know about your product. It was at the clinic, the doctors use it over there, but it was my sister who's our chief content uh, officer. And I saw that she was doing a protocol and I was like, oh, what's, what's this? And she said, oh, this is this company. You gotta look into it and that's what they're up to. And then right at the time we had a mutual friend, Mitchell, who, oh, awesome. uh, who's an awesome guy, um, coached the different CEOs that are out there. Shout out to Mitchell who said, oh, you know, I know that company and I know uh, Kieran very well. I'm going to this conference. You guys got to like connect there, which is how this interview ended up. Yeah, ended that up timing happening. of all that is so awesome. Yeah, no, it's really great. great. But you were saying that consumers have, were the ones that went and kind of educated their doctors. And I learned about it through my sister, who was a big fan of uh, the, the products. Yeah, that's awesome. That's it's such a great connection there. And, and we're finding, I mean, consumers are vigilant about, you know, their health and wellness. And it's really where the future of healthcare is gonna go, right? I mean, because again, the consumers are spending the time with and sitting there and researching all this stuff, listening to great programs like you've put together, you know, all of these great resources that are providing them with information and education. A lot of doctors don't have the time to do that. And so they're learning from their patients. And so part of well, why I love participating in things like podcasts and so on is, you know, we want to get this information out there as much as we can to the average consumer, because they're going to be a conduit for the medical professionals to learn of the new things that are going on. So when somebody's thinking about probiotics and they're thinking about taking stuff to support their general health, right? What I, what I love about when you work with, th things are so much more complicated than then they kind of seem and every yeah. company that's out there is like, we have the one solution for this issue or this idea, or you read an article that says probiotics are good for this. So then you go to Costco and you buy these probiotics or Walmart or whatever else. They're all made with different standards and things like that. So at the end of the day, I think that it is nice when people work with a functional practitioner or nutritionist or just somebody that can navigate the landscape a little bit versus just kind of flopping down the aisles of even like a whole foods, you know, yep. you don't really know what you're going to get. Um, but when people are thinking about probiotics in the landscape that's out there, uh, you know, we know that you're a fan of, of the spores. We know you obviously wouldn't have started the company. Are there other solutions that are out there that can also work? Are you a fan of these probiotics? You know, we already know one challenge, which is that they don't survive. A lot of them don't survive uh, the stomach acids yeah. that we put them through. What are some other challenges with the sort of products on the market? So to me, the biggest challenge is we don't really know what most of these products do in the gut, 
right? So when you're adding in 100 billion of 15 cells, uh, 15 different strains into your gut microbiome, and the company that's, that's uh, producing and promoting the product has not done a study to show what is the impact of those microbes on the rest of the population. Is it increasing diversity? Is it improving the keystone strains? Is it improving postbiotic production, things like short chain fatty acids? If they haven't verified that, then you really don't know what the impact is. And the way that the a lot of these products get made is that they might be one research paper that somebody at a university did or some researcher did, and they'll say that this strain has shown benefit for this thing, but it's not looking at the whole impact of what's happening inside the gut. Absolutely, and, and here's uh, my biggest contention, and this is when I was consulting for a lot of companies in product development, this is the thing I'd hammer them on all the time, right? So um, even the higher level probiotics out there where people are calling them clinically studied or clinically researched, what that means nine out of 10 times is that the individual strains in the product have studies on them, showing that this individual strain has this benefit, that individual strain has that benefit. But then what they'll do is they'll combine all these strains together and presume that the combination is overall beneficial. You don't know that, you know, that's a massive scientific leap to know that if A by itself is beneficial and B by itself is beneficial, A plus B doesn't necessarily mean super beneficial, right. you know? And because these are microbes, they're, the way they work in the body are so much more complex than nutrients, right? These are living organisms with lots of DNA and RNA and, and proteins and all these things that can impact us in many different ways. So the presumption that when you combine numerous clinically studied str strains, that the combination is beneficial is a massive leap in what's going on most of the time in the probiotic industry. Now, I, and there's also this mentality of creating kitchen sink formulas, which is what I call them, where my competitor has a product that has 15 strains and 50 billion CFUs. So in order to compete with them, I'm gonna create 17 strains and 65 billion CFUs, right? right? Because on the shelf, that makes it look better. It's like an arms race. Exactly, it's an arms race to like, a, I don't know where it's gonna end. I mean, there are products out there that are reaching a trillion CFUs in a single dose. It's it's mind boggling to me. And there's no science that shows that 200 billion is better than 10 billion. You know, it's all about the quality of the strains and the combinations that you use. So my what I always tell people is look for products that have clinical studies on the actual finished formulation. You know, not products that say, we have clinically studied strains. Well, those strains are studied under completely different conditions than how you're taking them. So their impact in your body are not gonna be equivalent to what is done in that particular study. And these are microbes, even though most of them are produced to be, are, are presumed to be safe, we still don't know what the long-term impacts are of taking these kind of products, right? So people have to be cautious, there should be studies, and one of my big contentions in our industry in general is the vast majority of companies in our industry do not do research, you know, and we should be doing that, right? We are the drivers of integrative health. We're the drivers of integrative medicine. We should be adding to the, to the knowledge base, the scientific knowledge base. And from day one, that's been our focus. You know, we've got 16 uh, human clinical trials either completed or ongoing right now. That is, 15 more than the vast majority of companies mm -hmm. in our space that are much bigger companies than we are. Right? On the finished product. On the finished, finished formulation product, that people are actually consuming. is going through that. Not Absolutely. Just the individual yeah, and we, in there. fact, we take production product, you know, off of the production line, you label it differently for clinical trials, obviously, because they're blinded and so on, you code them and all that. But we're taking products from the production line because we want it to be as similar to what someone would be spending their hard earned money buying and consuming with the hope that it's gonna help them. you know. And so we wanna mimic that exact consumer scenario. Whereas a lot of the studied strains, this is the, another problem I found is, when researchers are doing studies on singular strains, they're maintaining the strains under different conditions in a laboratory than you would have it in a commercial setting, right? These strains are freeze dried versus spray dried, for example. Um, they're maintained in certain refrigerated conditions and delivered in a very special way. Then when you come to the commercial strains, they're spray dried, they're sitting on a boat for two months coming in from overseas, then they're sitting on the shelf for six months. All of those things aren't factors in the clinical part of the trial. Mm. So, so those gaps need to be bridged. And we've got a really awesome opportunity as health companies within the nutritional space to really change the landscape of healthcare if we focus on research.
So I'm a big fan of like lifting the space up and you guys are doing it right and you guys are doing it well. And I know Dr. Hyman speaks uh, very highly of you guys. Uh, who else is doing it well, right? Is there anybody, yep. you know, because there's so few people and I'm all about education for the people that are listening on the podcast yep. so that they know that the people who really care about their education, they're not afraid to shout out other people who are doing it well, even totally. if they're not involved in it because yep. they just want people to have better options. So that other people that are in the space when it comes to specifically uh, the gut microbiome or probiotics that are doing it well and doing it the right way. Yeah, you know, um, the, the big suppliers of strains are doing a phenomenal job, like Lelamon, for example, uh, which, is, <clears throat> which is a massive company that actually produces a lot of verified and uh, validated strains. They focus a lot of research on the microbiome and the impact on the microbiome. Um, but there's a, there's a company called uh, BioCult, out of the UK, we're actually meeting with them in a, in a month or so to see if there's some collaborative things we can do. BioCult is a is a company that's investing heavily in research in their probiotic products. Um, some of those products are actually now available in the health food stores in the US. Um, and then a very similar name, BioK, is a, is a Canadian-based company that actually has a probiotic shot. It's like a little yeah, fermented thing. Yeah, you see it in things. Whole Food. It's in you the do. refrigerated section. Yep, exactly. And they, what I, I love about the company is they're actually, they've done a lot of research on the product. They actually are the only company um, in Canada that has an approved claim against prevention of C. diff infection in their mm -hmm. little shot. Um, so they're investing in research. They're doing a great job. Um, and then there are there's another company called Biobotanical Research in our health space that works on antimicrobials. Um, and they do a lot of work on antimicrobials that help with Lyme and dysbiosis and pathogenic bacteria. Um, and they really push on the research as well. So there are a good handful of companies that are doing it. Unfortunately, the vast majority of companies don't do any research, but these companies are doing a great job with, with work. So. I want to conclude here because there's been so much incredible information. We could keep talking. I've, I've probably only got to <laughs> half of my questions, but um, we'll have to do part two. I we'll guess. have to do a part yeah. two. What, what are the things that you do in your daily life in addition to supporting it with the strains that you've come up with? We know that so much of health and so much of our gut health is more than just a pill that we take, yep. even if it is the best pill that's out there. It's the other components and factors in our life. So what are some things that you, as a researcher, are doing in your own life on a daily basis, the habits that support a healthy microbiome? So super important question. Um, and, I, and I love it because I actually put my microbiome through loads of stress, right? I uh, travel a lot. I fly over 300,000 miles a year. So I'm on planes all the time. I'm in different time zones. In a given week, I could be in seven different time zones in a seven-day period. That all wreaks havoc on the microbiome. Um, but my whole focus is building resilience, right? Within the microbiome, like it's too hard for me to live a very puristic lifestyle where I'm never eating gluten, never eating dairy or any of these things. Um, I want to have resilience. I want my body to be able to handle some of these things that are not necessarily good for you. Um, so the couple of things I do besides taking the spores is intermittent fasting. That's one of the best things you can do for your microbiome. And it's counterintuitive that fasting actually increases the diversity in the microbiome. And in fact, fasting helps gr uh, the growth of microbes that can only grow in a fasted state. And as it turns out, these microbes, when they grow, they turn on processes called autophagy and mitophagy, which I'm sure you've spoken about on your show, but it's a cleanup system in your body. It gets rid of aberrant DNA and proteins and cells that are dying and so on. So that whole cleaning crew activation uh, in part is stimulated by not putting food into your system. So I do almost a daily 16 hour fast. And to me, that becomes a really important part of my body staying in some sort of balance. So that's like a time restricted eating period where you're gonna, you're not gonna eat for this window. Yeah, exactly. Like right now, I mean, I, I ate dinner last night around nine o'clock and I probably won't eat anything um, till about two or three o'clock today. So I basically kind of skip breakfast and I eat my first meal as a lunch or late lunch. Well, I'd like no. to ask you a question on this, you know, and again, everybody's gotta do what works for them. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that when I don't eat in the morning, right, I didn't really have like the brain power and capacity. So I was talking to uh, Walter Longo and his team. Mm -hmm. And one thing that they were saying is that, and you look at societies around the world that fast, like in India and other places like that, 
they all still eat. You know, their fasting tends to be later in the day. Yes. Right. Yep. They still eat something in the morning because our brains, which are very reliant on fats and other things like that to get going, they kind of need a little bit of that fuel. So a lot of the blue zones and other places they were saying, I haven't looked into this myself. They were saying that those people actually do eat in the morning. Do you have any yep. thoughts on that? Absolutely. And that's actually true. Um, in fact, if we look at the fasting di- uh, the studies on fasting, there's actually more benefit to fasting through the late afternoon and evening period. The problem for me is uh, with my it's travels really and all that, possible. it's not possible because I have a lot of dinner meetings and all that. It would make for very awkward meetings if I'm the one guy sitting there not <laughs> eating anything, you know, but I never set up breakfast meetings. So it's easy for me to skip the morning. So I'm getting a lot of the benefit from my window being from about 8 or 9 p.m. till about 12 o'clock noon the next and day. And do you have anything you know? for you personally? Do you have anything in the morning? Coffee, anything? You know, tea? I do sometimes have coffee, black okay. coffee. Now black I know coffee. that uh, black coffee has actually a good stimulatory effect on your microbiome. It can act as a prokinetic. If you have a clean coffee, the caffeic acid within coffee actually reduces some of the inflammatory response in the gut itself. And actually there was a fantastic meta-analysis that came out that looked through all of the the research on coffee, and in general, coffee is actually good for you. Yeah, you know, it's certain people may not be able to handle it as as well, but um, I would say if you can do the fasting in the evening, that's that's a great way to go about it. I've just never been able to do it because of my schedule and the way life works. I think once I retire, I would probably switch to that, where I'm enjoying my morning food and then probably stop eating right around lunch and not eat again till the next morning. But right now, dinners are such a big part of the professional life that I can't skip it, you know? Yeah. But any kind of fasting you can do is actually beneficial. You know, that's one of the things I tell people is that we've, we've you know, kind of gone through this moment in society where we think feeding is so important, right? And eating six, seven meals a day and always being fed, that fed state is a, is a, is a very, um, you know, catabolic state um, and we want to go into a different anabolic state when we have more fasted period. So that's one of the important things I do. The second thing is I try to get as diverse in my diet as possible. Understanding that our ancestors ate around 600 different types of foods annually, and a healthy Westerner maybe eats 20 different types of foods. And that determines our micro, the diversity in the microbiome in a large way. Um, so that is something I focus on. I try to eat, you know, eat ethnic foods as much as I can. I try to eat plant-based foods as much as I can. Our microbiome loves plant-based foods. Even though we're considered hunter-gatherers or descendants of hunter-gatherers, our ancestors actually gathered more than they hunted. You know, hunting was a, uh, required a lot of energy. It was risky. If you went out hunting, you could get killed. And so they gathered and foraged a lot more than they tended to hunt. So we kind of have that mentality where we eat we eat things predominantly that we would have foraged or gathered rather than hunted, we would probably be helping our microbiome significantly. And then the last thing is trying to clean up my environment of antimicrobial contents, uh, compounds all over the place, right? One of the things I explain to people is that we are a microbial construct in any way we look at it, right? We are a holobiome, a super organism. We are loaded with microbes. There isn't a square millimeter in our body, including our blood, that's not covered with microbes. And those microbes dictate so much of our health. And we've taken this beautiful, elegant, complex microbial construct and put it in an antimicrobial world. Right. We have shot ourselves in both foot, <laughs> both feet, if you will. In our offices, right? in our home. Everything, our right? Bathroom. The off gassing from the glues that we use in the paints. Um, yeah, all of our personal care products are loaded with antimicrobials. Or of course, our glyphosate roundup that we're exposed to in our food all the time, which we have a study on on that. Um, everything around us kills bacteria. And, and that's just not good for how we're designed. So I try to minimize the personal care products, uh, the household products and all that in my personal life that I know kill bacteria. And off the top of your head, like what are one or two that everybody's experiencing every day that you really want to find an alternative for yep. that we expose ourselves to? So one of the most important things is the household cleaning products. You know, we have this mentality that we need to sterilize our home, right? That, that, chlorine smell is actually programmed to our system as like a clean smell. It's actually the smell of death. You know, <laughs> that same smell is in hospitals and, the, and hospitals are the place where you pick up the most dangerous, uh, you know, pathogenic bacteria, right? And so our homes actually need to have a really healthy microbial environment. 
Uh, one of the simplest ways to do that is most of the surfaces, and it's fine if you want to sterilize your toilet and maybe your shower every once in a while, there's mildew growing, but most of the contact surfaces in your home don't need to be sterilized. The way I clean my home is I have a spray bottle of water. I add a couple of drops of essential oil just for smell, and we spray water and wipe the, the, the most of the contact surfaces with just a cloth. You know, that's the kind of cleaning we tend to do. And then we have a dog. And here's the beauty of dogs. Studies show that households that have animals, like pets, like dogs especially, have kids that have lower incidence rates of asthma, allergies, and other dis immune dysfunctions because our wonderful canine friends go out there and pick up microbes from the outside environment and bring them in and inoculate our household. Right, and so that is a really important aspect of it. Um, and also studies show that households that have six, seven or more people in them tend to have people with overall healthier outcomes as well because we are sharing microbes with one another and that sharing is really important as well. So as simple as hugging more people that you see, you know, that is sharing of microbes, um, you know, being in closer proximity to other humans, which in this world, because we can be so physically disconnected and yet connected through our devices and all that, we negate some of that physical contact and that physical contact is really important. So those simple things I keep in mind. And I'll add one to what you said from earlier, being in nature and getting those spores naturally. Yes, absolutely. So important. We need to engage with nature as much as we can. If we have a child that is on the spectrum, if we have kids who, are, who have allergies, we have allergies, we have health issues, all of those things can be significantly helped by just going out in nature, you know, going for a hike, getting some dirt on you, getting some grasses on you, getting to the beach, all these simple things, uh, kind of reconnecting with the source of our kind of our lifeblood, which is the microbes in our system. Kieran, this has been a fascinating conversation. You've gone to so many things we just haven't covered before. I know I've said that again, but that's tough on a podcast like this where we go deep into <laughs> a lot of topics, multiple people talking about the gut microbiome and bacteria. So I really want to thank you and appreciate you for being here. How can our listeners find out more about you and uh, the companies that you started? Absolutely. Please uh, have them. You can visit microbiomelabs.com. So we have um, a lot of engagement on there as well. We, we have a blog that you can find from microbiomelabs.com. Um, you can find a lot of our research articles and write-ups and all that on the microbiome, which are basically educational focus for people. Um, if you go on YouTube and put my name in, Kieran Krishnan, you'll find loads and loads of um, interviews that people are very, very gratefully have uploaded uh, that I've done with them. And a lot of them focus on these types of topics. And some of them go in even more detail than we've even gone into. So uh, YouTube, Microbiome Labs, great areas to, to find what we're doing. And are you on social media? I am, yeah, actually on Facebook and Instagram. It's actually my own personal. I've never gone to developing a professional page like a lot of people recommend, uh, but I'm totally terrible at social media. And so, um, but so it's just my personal pages. So yeah, please friend and follow. Um, I engage with people a lot on social media uh, and always happy to provide them with information and resources when they're looking for answers for their own health and wellness. Fantastic. So if you like this interview and you want to give a shout out, Hit Kieran up on social media. Kieran, yeah. it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming to our studio here in Santa Monica and uh, doing this uh, incredible interview with us. This, is, this has been an absolute pleasure for me. And thank you for having me. And thank you for doing this, actually. To me, the future of healthcare is empowering people with information, right? Everyone's got to advocate for themselves. And these kind of programs are so important in doing that. So what you're doing is a future of health and wellness in our world, in our society. I'm very excited and honored to be a small part of it. Thank you. Well said. Thank you for that. 